of Jericho fell down. Now that's basically, that's the faith of the children of God. That's the faith of them following God's leadership and what he said to do, even though it did not make sense whatsoever. Um, they were not to attack the walls. They were just merely to walk around them. And I, I, this is not the message, but I will throw this at you. So get ready to catch it. Um, the, uh, the, the step that God gave Israel when it came to, the, to Jericho was to merely make sure that God got the glory for the battle. It was to make sure, uh, get this, it's, it is all throughout God's word, the, um, the principle of first fruits belonging to God is seen from Old Testament all the way through into the New Testament. Uh, I've had many people that will argue, yes, that's talking about first fruits of all that increase. That's dealing with crops. Well, yeah, if you want to get single minded and not talk about, you want to talk about specifics and not about the principle. Um, it was talking about the crops and their flocks and their herds. Uh, but let me just remind you, um, everything the Bible talked about when it came to God getting the first fruits, God having the first of what we get, uh, when it talks about their flocks and their crops and all the, their harvest and everything, understand that was their wealth. That was their life. That was their livelihood. That was everything they ever could own or have or possess in any way, shape, or form. So it was their possession, period. So whether you want to talk about physical things or you want to talk about money, regardless, um, God deserves the first fruits of all thine increase. The principle of first fruits is seen in, in many different ways, but you also see it here in the story of dealing with Jericho and the walls of Jericho and all that takes place. Understand, Jericho was the first battle that God's people faced. It was the first conquering step in the promised land that God said is not yours to claim, it's mine. Jericho is not yours to have, it's mine. They were told, of course, it's a whole nother story. We won't get into that. But uh, you know about Achan and how Achan was, uh, he was Achan uh, afterwards because um, he disobeyed God. He took what belonged to God. God said, all the spoil of Jericho belongs to me. God said, man is not to have any of it. It is the first fruits. It's the first belongings to God. So understanding all of that, the Bible says by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. That was the faith of God's people following God's plan. And it says, of course, it continues to say after they were compassed about seven days. Verse number 31 really deals with the individual that we're going to look at this morning and again tonight. It says by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Rahab is mentioned in the hall of faith. And there's other things that Rahab received as well because of the faith that she showed. But I want you to understand many people and sometimes people will look at Rahab and think that, well, she was part of the children of Israel. No, she wasn't. Uh, she became part and we'll get to that later on. Uh, but she was not originally part of the children of Israel. And some people look and say, well, well, Rahab was a horrible person. And yes, her history uh, she is known as Rahab the harlot. Okay, she did not have a good history. But Rahab uh, saw that some things change in her life because of the faith that she showed and that she invested in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that we serve. And, and through that faith, God gave her many promises and many blessings. But I want, I want you to see, if, if you're in Joshua chapter 2, look at verse number 17. And, uh, and I don't have time to really show you everything that I want to show you tonight. So that's, I'm, yes, I'm baiting you and, and using the hook. I want you to come back tonight, if at all possible, to get a real good understanding of the history uh, of what all took place and, and the uniqueness of what she did. But I want to show you how Rahab's deliverance is a picture of salvation to start with this morning. And then tonight we'll look at Rahab's deliverance uh, as being a challenge to the child of God. 
But through it all, we're looking at this thought of feeling like God left you hanging. Because that is the way a lot of folks feel about God. He just left me out there hung to dry. God is just, you know, he, he gave me all these promises. He's, he's given us all these, all these things to stand on. And then we get out there and it feels like I'm all alone. Uh, but let me show you what Rahab did. Look at verse number 17. It says, and the men said unto her, these are the spies that she took in uh, and that she housed and she hid and she listened to them. And they said, the men said unto her, we will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house, uh, household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business... Then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, according unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to pray and then we're going to look at Rahab's deliverance. I'm going to give you, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a, of a, a basic history. I'm going to dig more into it tonight though. And uh, if you really want the meat of where we're going, you've got to come back tonight. But we're going to look uh, this morning at, uh, at how her deliverance is a picture, a beautiful picture of salvation that any individual, even today, can experience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your house. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. Well, we thank you for, as it was just sung, the power of, of the cross Mainly because, Lord, not many, many folks through history in Roman settings were hung on a cross and died that way. But, Lord, only one died that we might receive forgiveness. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son to die for us. As undeserving as we are, Lord, that through the shed blood on the cross of Calvary, there is power to salvation. Not only to save us, but to keep us for all eternity. Lord, forgiven and our sins washed away. We thank you that we have a chance to look, even at, back in the Old Testament, at how you gave us a beautiful picture of the salvation that you offer. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us as we look at this, that the Holy Spirit would have, Lord, a free reign in this auditorium, that anything and everything that needs to be said would be said. Lord, you would refrain us from speaking what should not be said. I pray that you'd help us as we look at this, that we'd, uh, Lord, our eyes would be open. Lord, that we'd be encouraged for those of us that are saved, be encouraged to look at the beauty of salvation once again. There's one here that doesn't know you as their Savior. Lord, that they'd come to a realization of how simple it is just to place our faith and trust in their Savior who died for us. I pray that you just do the work that only you can do. We'll give you the honor and glory for all that's accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. Here, give you just a, a couple of, I say a couple, just a few notable, notable points concerning this particular passage of Scripture. Understand, God's people are getting ready to finally enter into the promised land. They had a chance before, and they blew it because they didn't trust God that he would keep his promise, and that regardless if, if they were uh, like uh, grasshoppers in the sight of the people, they were, they were puny compared to the giants in the land. It did not matter as long as God was on their side. They had uh, evidently at this time, they had learned their lesson from their ancestors. Understand uh, all those 21 and above, I believe it was 21 and above that, uh, that had not gone in the promised land the first time. They did not see the opportunity of going in the promised land, save the two individuals, uh, Joshua and, and Caleb. And as they looked at these, these areas, they said, you know what, we're, uh, we're going to go in. We're, let's trust God. And um, unfortunately, uh, the ten outweighed the two. And uh, God's people decided not to go in the first time. God punished them uh, by the years that they wandered in the wilderness. By the way, just to let you know, wilderness wanderings uh, that took place. Uh, when we think about the wilderness, we think it took them that long to get all the way around the wilderness. Heck no. 
They did circles in the wilderness. They passed that rock the same time, many times. That one looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, we've been through that about 10 times already. Here's the thing. They went round and round and round and round. They wandered in the wilderness until God finally said, okay, the last person who doubted is dead. I'm going to take y'all into the promised land if you'll follow me. At this point, they've decided they're going to follow God. And Joshua has sent uh, spies into the land once again just to find out where things are and, and, uh, and to see, just be honest with you, as a battle strategy, what should they do to start with? They did seek the Lord's leadership, and they sought uh, what he wanted for them. But it's only wise to send in the spies to look and see at, at how things are going. They're going to go out to Jericho. They know that's where God wants them to go. They know that's the first city they're, they're there to attack. It's going to be God's uh, battle. It's going to be the reward that, that he deserves as taking them in, the first fruits of the conquering of the land. But they're going to go and, and search it out just because that's the way you do things. That was just a wise decision to make. So as these spies go in, they go to Jericho to investigate it. And uh, they, they go to the, the house of Rahab the harlot. Now, you just think about that. God's people go into a strange city. And the first place they visit is a harlot's house. Now... That doesn't really make sense because what is the one place we say we, you got to stay away from some places, right? Um, but they go there. Why? Because God had prepared one of the women that was the least of society. God had begun to do a work in her heart far beyond and way, way before the children of Israel had ever entered the land or planned to enter the land. And uh, Rahab was known for her lifestyle. The Israelites were to stay away from people like her. It would be nothing unusual for strange men to stay at her house. And if you think about this, it was a very good strategy for these strangers to go to a place where it was not unusual for strangers to visit. Pretty good strategy plan. God had prepared Rahab. To be the individual that he would use to protect his people as they began to prepare for battle. The entire area at that time was in great fear of the Israelites. And the Bible tells us that their hearts melted uh, like wax. They were in great fear because of what they had heard concerning this great number of people. And it was all part of God's plan. Every single bit of it. The Lord had already begun to do the work in Rahab, in his people, things are starting to come together. And so as the spies come in, the spies are there. She protects them. But she says this. She says, because of what I've done for you, I want me and my family, I want us to be spared. And we'll probably read it here in a minute. But she basically told the spies, I know that, that God has sent you. And I know that y'all are going to be victorious. I know this place is doomed. And I want to be spared. And I want my family to be spared. And so they gave her the command that we read just a minute ago. That she is to leave that scarlet line, that cord that they were let down out of the window by. So as to get away safely and get back to Joshua and give a report of the city. And she was to leave that line hanging out the window. Now here's what I want you to understand. She's to leave that line hanging out the window when they come into the land. So that when they come to Jericho, that is the evidence of her faith in God. Now, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit this morning because I want to give you more of the details that I, I've got to wait for tonight to give to you. Because it really gets good when you look at what she did in spite of the obstacles before her. I will tell you this, to lay out that scarlet line was an evidence of her treachery and her treason. It pointed directly to the problem that Jericho had within their own ranks. She was the one that turned her back on her king, on her country, on her friends. 
Those that did not enter into her house, she would be the enemy to all that would not follow the belief that she has now claimed. That scarlet line hanging out the window was all the evidence that was needed to convict her and send her to her death. Way before the children of Israel ever came into the land. The spies said, you're to put that scarlet line out when we come in the land. When we come against Jericho. I, I will remind you, I'll just, I'll just point this out to you. That when we read in verse number 21, that they left and she agreed to what they said. And when they left, it says, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. She did not wait for them to come into the land. As soon as they were let down, she bound that line up and she, she left it there. From the point the spies left, and I'm not going to go through all the days. I'm going to do that tonight. Y'all get what I'm doing here? Okay. But from the point they left until the point that the children of Israel actually surrounded the city and the walls finally fell seven days later. From the point that they left her house and fled, uh, by the way, I just give you a little hint, fled to the mountains first before they ever went back across the Jordan to see Joshua. From the point they left to the point those walls fell was not just the next day or a few hours. And yet she hung that line out the window as an evidence, this is my faith in a God that I'm choosing to give my life to. Now watch. As she does that, it's actually many, many, many days that line hangs out the window. She hangs that line out there knowing that it could be her death, knowing that it was her treachery in evidence right before them. I don't know if God just hid from the king's eyes that he couldn't see it because they were looking for the spies, remember? They came to her house trying to find them. She hid them and then helped them escape. So they were looking for them. They knew they were there and they knew they had been to her house how crazy would it be to then take the very evidence that you help them and make sure that it's in plain sight for everybody to see? But yet that evidence was not just the evidence of what the king there or the leadership of Jericho needed to prove her guilt. It was the evidence of the faith that she was placing in the God of all creation. That, that scarlet line or that cord being a symbol of her faith in verse number 15, it's just simply a rope that she let them down with. Verse number 18, it's called the line and became a symbol of faith. In the Hebrew, uh, the, the, the word is titbah, basically meaning a cord. But figuratively, if you look at definition, figuratively, uh, that cord turned into hope, expectancy, or here's the great thing out of, out of uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. He says in literal sense, it was just a cord. But in the, the figurative sense of what it, what it became, he said it became hope. It became expectancy or that thing I long for. That one evidence of her faith said I'm longing for the promise that God has given me. Now she's not an Israelite. She's not of God's people. But she did some things that changed her life dramatically. And the picture of, uh, of her deliverance, what takes place, shows us very clearly what God does through salvation. I just want to give you a few points and I'll be done this morning. And then we'll, tonight we are really going to dig in. I'm going to show you just how spectacular what she did actually was because it's a challenge to the child of God.
Not only is it evidence and showing a beautiful picture of a lost person who can receive God and, and receive the promise of forgiveness and be brought into a family that she was not a part of before that point, but she's brought into the family of God because of her faith in God. You listen, it's always been by faith. Salvation has always been by placing faith and trust in God and his way, not following our way. And so she followed his way, picture of salvation. Tonight we're gonna, we will look at how that applies to the child of God. Once you know Christ your Savior, the, the challenge that we receive by what she did. But let's look at what she did here as a lost individual. We find out in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. I'm going to get through this. Here's where we're going to go a little bit faster, all right? I'm going to go through these different points so we can be done. But in, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 to verse 11, it says, And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. She's declaring what she believes. And that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land... Faint because of you, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man. And so as you look at this, she has made a, a declaration that, listen, we have heard. The Bible tells us in Romans uh, chapter, chapter 10, verse 14, 14, how shall they hear without a preacher? Listen, the Bible tells us that the message of the truth of who God is and what he offers has got to be heard. And when somebody declares, hey, I have heard the truth. I have heard who your God is. She had heard the message and wasn't just her. Understand everyone else. She's declared, listen, I'm not the only one that's heard about who your God is. I'm not the only one that's heard about uh, how powerful and how true. And he is the only one true God. Evidenced by what he has done. Just by what we've heard, we know. Or she said, I know it's true, but we've all heard. Here's the great thing that you understand about this. Listen. Everyone will stand before God without the ability to say, Lord, I've got a good excuse. Now, we are to take the gospel. But I said before, at one point, the world, the known world was turned upside down with the truth of the gospel. Every generation has had the chance to receive from, from passing down generation to generation. Every tribe, every people group has had the opportunity to pass truth down. Unfortunately, man has corrupted truth. And in many cases throughout this world, there are many places that today there are those who have not heard. Though it's, to some degree, it's the fault of their own ancestors that have not kept truth alive. And so you say, well, then we're, we're not responsible to get the, the message of the gospel around the world. You see, because they once had it, they lost it. It's their fault. It's not our responsibility. Eh, wrong answer. This generation is responsible to reach this generation with the gospel. The Bible does declare that even the heavens declare the glory of God. You look around and you have to know there is, if you're at least if you're willing to admit that man can be flawed, you have to admit there is a God. Only those that believe that man is the ultimate being and we are as God, they believe that they are God. They don't need God and therefore they believe there is no God. But to look around and understand we are flawed, you need to understand that even nature itself proves that there is a God. She hears about God and then you understand uh, that she believes in God. In the last part there of verse number 11 in chapter 2, where she said there remained no more courage in any man because of you. 
She said, for the Lord your God. Now watch. This is not a general declaration. This is her personal declaration. She says, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Of all the people that heard the same stories and, and heard all about what the God of the Israelites could do, she is the one that said, listen, I don't know about everybody else. I know every single one of us, we're scared. <laughs> every single person, right? There's not a single person that I know of that isn't so fearful that they're melting like wax. They don't even want to face you because they're afraid of your God. But she said, here's the thing. I personally come to a conclusion that what I've heard and what I've, I'm seeing for myself, even without meeting God's people, except for you showing up at my house, what I know of your God and what he has done for you and what he has done through you, this much I personally believe that Jehovah God, if you notice there, she said, for the Lord your God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, she actually even got it right. She didn't say, for this Lord, your God is a God. She said, no, Jehovah. I just think she, she probably was curious enough to find out who is this God. Listen, when somebody's searching for truth, they will look for it. And when someone looks for truth, God will always be sure that truth finds them. And when people want truth, they'll recognize truth and they'll cling to truth. That's what she did. And what she's saying here basically is, we've all heard, but I've chosen to believe. We all know from the stories we've been told, but I choose to believe that your God, Jehovah God, he is Lord of all. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. What she's saying is, there is no other, and I'm ready to go ahead and give my life to you. She's come to this conclusion all by herself because of the truths that she's seen and heard. She becomes then obedient to God, which is what takes salvation in salvation. The only work, and let me just put it this way, we do not believe in a work salvation, but I love tricking people up with things. I love throwing the little monkey wrenches in. I looked at people and said, We don't believe in works, but there's only one work we gotta do to be saved. Huh? Here it is. Obedience. The Bible says the price for forgiveness has already been paid. That was what Christ did and what he has done is done and finished. There is nothing else to do for salvation, for forgiveness to be offered and it to be permanent when received. Nothing else has to be done. It's already been accomplished through Jesus Christ. But you understand, we don't just receive forgiveness because it's there. The only way that an individual receives the forgiveness God offers is through obedience, doing it God's way, and asking with a repentant heart. So what does that mean? Well, that means that man does have one thing we have to do. We've got to swallow our pride, agree with God against ourselves, admit our sin condition, and then say, Lord, please forgive me. That is an act of obedience. You must ask to receive. And you must repent to be forgiven. It's all in one action. You say, so, so we do believe in works. No, no, we just believe that God did all that had to be done but it's still based on our decision to trust and obey the only way. And she does just that. She hears, she believes, and then she obeys through verses, verse 17 through verse number 21, as we saw. Now watch. When they said, when we come into the land, you hang the scarlet line out, and that will be what will hold us to the oath that you will be saved. God will provide salvation for you and anybody that has believed with. Now understand, her family had to 
This is not teaching that you can just bring your household in and if one gets saved, you're all saved. No. They had to believe and obey and had to be in the house when the walls fell. But she had to reach them. She had to tell them. She had to share with them what it is that she had decided to do and the faith that she's placed in God and where she's going to be when the day comes. And she had to, through her testimony, had to win them to the same belief and obedience that she had already practiced. And when they believed what she believed, and they decided they would trust in that Jehovah God just as she has. They would enter that house. And as long as they were there together, they were safe. Because God would always keep his promise that he would not bring punishment and judgment on them. Because of their faithfulness and obedience ultimately to obey the will and command and only way of God for salvation. And in that particular picture, being in the house with the scarlet line, upon the moment the walls fell, when judgment came, they were enclosed in the protection that God gave, the salvation that he provided. They were in the house, just like we are in Christ upon the moment of salvation. So she believed, she was obedient, she received that promise. In Joshua chapter 6, and I'm not, I'm not going to go there, you can read it, but chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, 23, she receives the promise that God gave her because of the scarlet line. Now here's the thing. In receiving that promise, understand her past was destroyed. Guess what? When the city fell, it fell completely to rubble. Every house, it wasn't just the walls that fell. You understand, the only thing that remained when Jericho fell was one house that, by the way, was on the wall. Think about that. How did she let them down out the window and them escape if it wasn't on the wall when she let them down there outside the wall? When they ran from her house on the ground, they were already outside the walled city of Jericho and they ran to the mountains to hide for a bit while the, the leadership of Jericho was searching for them. So her house was on the wall. Everything else around the entire City of Jericho, walls, houses, everything crumbles basically to ashes. The only thing remaining is her house with a scarlet line hanging out a window. By the way, if you haven't figured out yet, the scarlet line represents only one thing. It was scarlet for a reason. That house was protected by the blood. <clears throat> An evidence that when an individual is placed in Christ through salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ protects against all judgment when it comes to when the end is here. <laughs> when we stand before God, what we're guilty for, he says, I don't see the guilt because the blood covers it all. Through obedience, you, you obey God's command. She received that promise. Her entire past with the city of Jericho, everything that she used to be, Rahab the harlot, everything she was was now wiped away. Her past was never to be remembered again. And through that, she was given a new home and a fresh start. When she was brought in, and we'll look at it again tonight a little bit more, but when she was brought into the children of Israel, she wasn't brought in as Rahab the harlot. She's brought in as Rahab, the one who had the faith and trust in God. Rahab who hung the scarlet line out the window. Rahab who God used to save 
his people. Rahab, the one that God used to bring victory. Rahab, the one who was an outsider, brought into the family. She was not originally part of the Jewish, Jewish people. She was not originally an Israelite, but she was adopted in. That's a picture of salvation, folks. You say, well, well she, she did something really good then to earn that. No, she disobeyed what God told her to do. And here's what I want you to, to really get, and we'll get into it a little bit more tonight. Especially for the child of God, how this applies. But Rahab did not wait for them to come into the land before she placed her faith. She had already heard. She had already believed. She decided she was going to obey. And that obedience started immediately. It wasn't delayed. She let them down. They flee to the mountains. The Bible said as soon as she let them down, and as soon as they were gone, she hung that line out her window, and it stayed there until God brought victory over Jericho. She didn't wait until it was the perfect time. I, it, right now feels like it's right. She didn't wait until she was guaranteed by sight that she could trust that this is actually going to happen. Understand, God's people were not even on their side of Jordan. They were on the other side of Jordan. They hadn't even crossed over yet. They're not even in the promised land. They're not even gotten close to Jericho. And she says, I'm still going to hang my faith on display so everybody can know who it is I'm trusting in. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I place faith in God. And I feel like he just left me hanging there. I place, people say, well, just trust in God and, and he'll forgive you and, and why, boy, then why do I have so much trouble? I just don't know that I can really trust God. I just don't know if I want to place my trust in him alone. There's got to be something more to it. It's too easy. It's too simple. It's called obedience. Simple obedience. Jesus said, I am the way. The truth. The life. There is no other way. There is no other truth. There is no other life apart from what Christ offers because of the shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Rahab had no other choice. She couldn't do it her way. She would have died with the city. Her family had hope because Rahab was willing to place her trust in the God that she had, listen, only heard of, but really had never met and never experienced anything. As a lost person, a lost person doesn't go into salvation because they know who God is and they know all about what he can know. A lost person goes in by faith. I've only heard about him, but I'm going to trust him. Because his word, I believe, is true. What I've heard, I believe, and I'll obey. And through that, we get to receive the promise that the old man has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The past is destroyed, never to be remembered. As far as the east is from the west, by the way, not that God doesn't know our past. We just know this action and we're done. But when we're forgiven, when salvation becomes a realization in our life, it's not that God doesn't know who we really are. It's that it can't be used as judgment against us. The guilt and penalty of sin is paid and gone. Therefore, when the accuser comes and says, but do you know who they are? The father says, yes, I do. But that record can no longer be used. It's not admissible. It's been covered, washed, done away with. And, uh, and if that's all you have, you need to go ahead and step aside because this individual can't be touched. It's no longer to be remembered. It's not admissible in court. That guilt is gone. Do you have anything else? I doubt it because it's covered by the blood. 
Rahab's past, gone, never to be brought up again, and yet brought into a family she wasn't originally a part of, given a future that she originally did not have. Just like a lost individual who comes to God. Gives us what we don't deserve. Takes away the sting of death in the grave. Takes away the guilt and wrath that we deserve. Places his mercy upon us and then gives us a limited amount of grace. So much he does for us. Rahab's experience, a beautiful picture. Her deliverance from her situation, a beautiful picture of salvation. Tonight, please do that. Tonight we'll look at the same story, but from the eyes of a child of God already saved. Look what she did by faith. That is a challenge to every child of God. That we can exemplify or we can show the same amount of faith that she showed. I'll give you more of the time frame. How long did that, that scarlet line hang out that window? From the point she tied it off and gave the evidence of her faith to the point that God actually came in, <laughs> delivered her from Jericho, and she received the promise. It's a lot longer than you might think. But her faith stayed strong, stayed where it belonged. We'll look at that tonight. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I don't know who in here knows for sure that they're on their way to heaven. I don't know who in here is struggling with salvation, if any. But the Holy Spirit knows. And I pray that you do a work in our hearts, in our lives. We've looked at Rahab and, Lord, uh, just... So little we did look at, so much more we could get into depth with, with her life and all that took, took place. But Lord, you know what we needed. And I, I thank you, Lord, we can have the picture of your wondrous salvation that you offer. Even through the Old Testament, you show us time and again what you do for an individual who will place their complete faith and trust in your way of forgiveness and deliverance. I pray, Lord, you'd help us this morning. If we looked at this, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray that they would respond, not putting it off, not delaying, but stepping out by faith to receive the free gift of salvation. This morning, without leaving and walking out the doors of this building, still unsure, I pray that you please do the work you want to do this morning in each heart, in each life. Heads bowed, eyes nice closed. Let me just ask the one question. If you were to die to... This morning, if you were to, before you even got out those doors, it could happen. It could happen. Before you even walked out those doors, if you were to fall over dead of a heart attack, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Have you ever truly, with a repentant, sincere heart, believed what God offers? It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Have you been obedient to God's way of salvation? Have you received Christ as your personal Savior? Do you have a testimony that you've taken action upon what man must do through obedience to receive forgiveness? If you were to say, preacher, right now, I'll be honest with you, I just don't know. I just don't know for sure that if I die that I would end up in heaven. I don't know for sure. I cannot go back to a time and place where I'm confident that I've received Christ as my Savior. As God says, it must be done. I just doubt. I just don't know where I'm for sure. I know I'm not saved. If there's somebody here who says, Preacher, that's me. I'm not sure or I just do not know, but I sure would like to talk to somebody about that. Is there somebody here who says, Preacher, I'll raise my hand. I'll say, that's me, Preacher. I need to talk to someone about my need of salvation. Anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher, that's me. Anybody in here? All right. The child of God. It's wonderful to look at the picture of salvation. When was the last time, though, that you did what Rahab had to do? She had to share it. She had to reach her family. In the time that she had left, she had to tell those she loved before it was too late. When was 
the last time that we shared what God offers to those that mean so much to us. So let's redeem the time. Redeem the time. Maybe it's the Lord lay somebody on your heart, somebody you know is not saved, or somebody that you're pretty sure is not saved. Lord, lay them on your heart. Maybe you just need to come to an altar and just ask the Lord to use you or someone to reach them with the gospel. May the Lord break our hearts to the lost. Let's stand. The invitation's open. The Lord, put somebody on your heart and on your mind. If you could come down to this altar, why don't you come and just ask the Lord to use you or someone to reach them. Maybe you just need to ask the Lord to put a, a burden on your heart. Bring the tears back. Lord, bring the desire to reach the lost. I don't know what it is. Lord knows. I surrender all. Invitations open. Give the opportunity. Speak to the Lord as he's speaking to you. God's house this morning, and uh, now don't don't let me. I know don't let me scare you off because I mean, we're gonna, we're going to get to all the meat. I've given you a lot of it already. Okay, I'm just going to be able to give you a little bit of the backstory with the time frames, and so you can see the amount of faith that she invested in a God that she had just placed her trust in. So much that we can do if we place our faith in the Lord, even when it's not easy. Especially when it's not easy. And uh, so, church, can encourage you, challenge you, be back tonight. We'll look at that. Doesn't mean that I'm going to have to go double the time just because there's so much to cover. All right? I got rid of half of that this morning, uh, hopefully. But uh, just y'all come on back. And I, I'm sure, I promise you, it'll be a blessing to you. It's a, a, something that a long time ago when I was reading, the Lord showed me that. And what I'm going to share tonight. And... Uh, it kind of changed the way I look at Rahab. Changed the way I look at what faith really is. And I guarantee you it'd be a blessing to you as well. So look forward to being back in God's house tonight. And be careful out there in the cold. And I don't know if it's raining or not still, but uh, it's definitely cold. But uh, let y'all be careful as, as we dismiss and go out. Thank you for being in God's house. Brother Will, do you mind dismissing us in prayer, sir? Thank mm-hmm. you.